It's really frustrating, isn't it? When you read a book, a paper, or a blog post on a particular topic, and you have a strong feeling that everything is clear and you have a firm grip on the information. But then, at the worst possible moment, for example, when the conversation shifts in that direction and it's your time to shine, all of the knowledge just magically slips out of your memory. Ooh, ooh, I know, I've read about this a couple of months ago. Uh, it's about, well, you know, basically like, uh, like, uh, yeah, that. Today I will talk about a very simple solution for overcoming that. How to actually remember what you read and make effective use of that knowledge. If you're ready, buckle up. My name is Artem, I'm a computational neuroscience student and researcher. Here we talk about the brain, both the theory of how it works under the hood, as well as practice of how to study and learn more effectively. If you're interested, consider subscribing to the channel not to miss anything. Before we begin, a little disclaimer. This video was inspired by an amazing essay titled Augmenting Long-Term Memory. This is a wonderful read which I totally recommend as a reference. In this video, I will talk about key points and share my own observations and examples of use cases. Before taking any actionable steps, it's important to understand why this problem arises in the first place. The underlying cause is the nasty property of memories to decay over time. If you measure the memory retention, that is, the fraction of knowledge that you can remember, you will see that the retention exponentially goes down. This is known as the Ebbinghaus curve. So, you can think of the brain as a leaky bucket, which you can fill with new information, but some portions of it will inevitably leak through the holes. But don't you think that our lives would be absolutely miserable if we couldn't keep the curve from going down? Fortunately, there is an easy trick to kick it back up, and that is to review the information, to refill the bucket with the same liquid, so to speak. And the good thing is that reviewing causes the forgetting rate to decrease. With each round of repetition, the curve goes down with less and less steepness. Until, after enough rounds of this process, the memory gets embedded in your brain so hard that the curve essentially flattens out. Congratulations! Now you can officially say that you remembered something for life. And this tactic of reviewing information over time is called spaced repetition. It's a very popular practice that you have probably heard about. It comes down to creating flashcards, which are then shown to you periodically at increasing time intervals. And the most popular software for automating this process is called Anki. It's free, open source, and it is quite powerful. And this is exactly what we're going to use. Up, 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 up. Don't turn off the video just yet. I promise you, it's not one of those Anki for medical students type of content. It's not like I don't acknowledge the existence of medical students. And this is where things get really interesting. Anki and space repetition in general are usually associated with remembering simple facts, like memorizing bones in the body or historical dates. However, I'd like to argue that there is so much more to spaced repetition than just that. It's an incredible tool for more high-level information processing as well. And the reason being is that memorization is essential for deep understanding. This is known as the Bloom's taxonomy the hierarchy of cognitive skills. Essentially, what it tells us is that before we can use the knowledge to create something new, find interconnections, build analogies and stuff like this, you have to do a lot of memorization. Remembering simple facts and definitions is like a basement which supports the rest of the building. And this is very often the hidden bottleneck for a lot of people. If your memorization suffers, the foundation becomes really unstable causing the entire pyramid to collapse. That's why it's important to address the root of the problem and not try to rebuild everything from the top on a shaky foundation. And this is exactly what we're going to do by using Anki as a powerful companion. But before we dive deep into the practice of turning books and papers into flashcards, I'd like to stress that it's important to choose the right source of information in the first place. And in case of books, there is a great platform to do so. Shortform, our today's sponsor, provides book guides, which are essentially book summaries, but on a whole other level. Not only they are super detailed, but they also have an extra layer to them in the form of so-called shortform notes. 
And this is the feature I absolutely love. They include information, which is beyond the scope of the book, but is still highly relevant, backed up by other books and research articles. Shortform publishes new book guides every week from a variety of genres, such as science, education, self-improvement, motivation, you name it. Shortform comes in handy at two stages of information processing. First of all, for choosing the right source, and then later, for refining notes and flashcards, thanks to the wonderful bird's eye view of the book. If you want to get five days of unlimited access and 20% discount on annual subscription, you can use my special link down in the description. The rule of thumb for, the rule of thumb for creating effective flashcards is to remember to ask questions. As you're reading the material, always search for a quirky question that might be asked regarding this information. Imagine yourself to be that annoying professor who always asks the worst possible question. Then create a flashcard with a question on the front and then type the answer as you see it on the back of the card. It's a really effective strategy to shape the cards in the Q&A form. Such layout will stimulate you to actively recall the information when you answer the cards while reviewing them. And let's take this article right here. I I'm kidding, it's just a stack of papers, there is nothing here. This paper describes the computational model of calcium dynamics in an astrocyte. And because it uses the concepts I wasn't familiar with at the time of reading, I created flashcards to memorize their definitions. For example, what is astrocytic volume fraction and what is spatial distribution? I also amplified some important modeling approaches. For instance, what is the formula of the Hill equation and what does it show? But it's not only technicalities that could be turned into flashcards. In fact, it's just as important, if not more important, to ask more general questions. For example, what is the conclusion of this paper? What assumptions it is based upon? What problems researchers faced when applying current solutions, etc. I recommend making the questions as atomic as possible. For example, don't create a massive umbrella flashcards along the lines of elaborate on this paper. It shouldn't take too much time and cognitive effort to answer a flashcard. If the answer takes up several pages, it's not really useful. Instead, Break it up into smaller pieces. Create separate questions on particular lab techniques, experimental design, underlying hypothesis, core results. But on the other end of the spectrum, try to avoid yes-no type of cards. Graphs and figures can also serve as a great source of flashcards. For example, you can phrase the questions in the form of draw the rough sketch of the relationship between the two variables or what pattern is observed under this specific condition. So basically kind of poke the paper from different perspectives and ask questions of different levels of detail, from concrete definitions and equations to big picture ideas and conclusions. Another thing to keep in mind is that flashcards work best for the books and articles you personally care about. You should make sure you are emotionally invested into creating and reviewing them on a regular basis. Because if it feels like a chore to open up Anki every time, you will very soon run out of willpower and abandon the activity altogether. That's why I recommend using this approach only for the papers you are passionate about and the ones that align with your long-term goals and priorities. For example, for something that's relating to your personal research or just the topics you find particularly fascinating. That's all I have for you today. Give this approach a go and see how it works out. If you liked the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and press the like button. Stay tuned for more interesting stuff coming up. Goodbye and thanks for the interesting knowledge.